What's going on, everyone? Welcome once again to the Bass Kayak and Beers podcast on the Paddle and Fin Network. Um, I recorded on back-to-back days. So if you listened to last week's episode, you know I didn't bring a beer. I just opened uh, like a sparkling water can because <laughs> I've been dealing with allergies, taking medication for the allergies, and I, I don't want to combine one thing with the other. Um, so I'm still with allergies. It's not that I've been two weeks without with allergies. It's just that I recorded back-to-back days. So no beer today. Um, I actually just got a protein shake. Went to Prefish Lake Whitney. A uh, little bit of a traffic jam. Got in late for my next guest, which is Cody Milton. He's in the back room waiting for this show to start. So Cody Milton is my guest for today. Um, super excited to have Cody Milton, uh, one of my favorite anglers. I'm a huge fan of what he's done. Ironically, I'm pre-fishing, like I said, for Lake Whitney, which by the time you hear this, it's already done. Um, but I was doing a lot of bed fishing and the, the fish that I caught on bed, I really have to credit Cody Milton. Cody Milton was my first guest when I moved to paddle and fin. I don't know if he knows that. Um, and the episode that we talked about was, um, his big win at the Hobie POS, which I think was about three years ago in Lake Fork. And we talked in depth about how he did the bed fishing. One of the things that stands out to me um, in that conversation was that he, I think he was like 15 minutes, just shallow anchoring, looking at a, at a bed and waiting for the female to come back and the patience that he had. And honestly, and I'm being completely honest, the fish that I've caught today on bed, I credit Cody Milton because I learned a lot from him. I've never, I had, hadn't done bed fishing until actually like two years ago. That's when I kind of started doing bed fishing because I've only been kayak fishing for like three or four years. Um, but I've really gone back to listen to that episode because I think it's pretty awesome. Obviously, he's really good at it. Um, but anyways, we're going to talk, be talking about his big win at Lake Cattle in the Pro, KBF Pro Series or Pro Circuit. I'm not sure what it's called. I think it's a Pro Series. And the, and the comparison of... Um, him fishing the KBF National Championship, which even though it was in Lake Cato, it was in that general area of um, Shreveport, Louisiana, I think it is. Um, so anyways, um, great episode. Super excited to have Cody Milton. We're going to go to quick commercials before we do that. As always, shout out to Douglas Rod. Go check out Douglas Rod's out. Just check, go check out Douglas Outdoors. Uh, dot com to check out their full lineup of LRS, X Matrix, and fly fishing rods. Quick commercial, and we'll be right back. Mr. Cody Milton, how are you today, man? Doing well. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, man. My honor to have you on the show. Um, congratulations on your big win on the cattle. How's it feel, man? Pretty good. Uh, yeah, actually, I um, is I kind of forgot about that episode you were talking about on Lake Fork, but I actually I did catch two fish bed fishing last weekend too. So, put yeah. a little full circle, yeah. Um, I, b- I believe they're spawning down there too, because I mean those lakes are starting to go off down there in you know East Texas and North Louisiana. Yeah, man, uh, bed fishing is something that I really started last year, and I never put a lot of emphasis on it before tournaments because I figured it's only like a you know, like a couple of weeks, maybe a month span. And then the rest of the year, it's like, do you really want to put that much emphasis on something that you're only going to do for maybe like two weeks a year? Um, but I decided I wanted to give it more of a try. And after listening to that ep- to that episode we recorded, and I don't blame you if you don't remember, because I'm sure you've done hundreds of episodes <laughs> on, in, on kayak podcasts and uh, live shows since then. But yeah, I really got into it. And last year, I fished a lake recreational, not a tournament. Mm-hmm. Wheeler Reservoir. Um, really clear water lake. And man, I saw huge bass bedding. And I yeah. kept throwing it in there, throwing it in there. And the male kept taking the lure, came to taking the lure. I didn't have anything to hold the male. So I just, yeah. every time I caught it, I had to put it back. Man, it was a huge bass. And I got so excited about it that I really wanted to kind of like honing my skills for it yeah. so it, it's awesome man it's really mm-hmm. interesting that was pretty did you watch uh drew cook at on the elite series at santee cooper last week or two weeks ago i guess now um did you would you watch any of that the on the live Bassmaster? the kayak series or the yeah, it was, 
boat side on the Elite Series? I didn't. I actually didn't, but I heard a lot about it. No, it was pretty legit. He, he did some things that I honestly, like, I, you know, it was, you know, like, I feel like a lot of times you learn so many things and you kind of, like, forget about a lot of them. He kind of mm-hmm. a couple of things that I'd forgot about um, and caught almost all of his fish doing it, like, knocking the bottom of that rod, you know? Like, he would hold it up and just, you know, just knock it with his hand and make that sound through the line. Um, and I actually did that at Caddo once, like, this past, you know, past week. So it was pretty... I don't know. It's kind of cool, you know, getting to see him do that a few weeks ago and, you know, working, working down south. Yeah, I've I've actually forgotten about that now that you yeah. mentioned it. Um, I did see a clip out of that video now that you mentioned it. Yeah, I've done that before. Not not for really bed fishing, but just for jigs. I never thought of it as a sound, just more like to get the some vibration or some yeah, subtle like the- movement on, on the jig. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I've done that. I maybe I'll put it in practice tomorrow in the tournament. That's what I was just trying to help. You. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, your buddy Matt Scotch is going to be fishing that one. That's always interesting. Yeah, going up, up against Matt Scotch. He's yeah, a hammer, of course. A good one. Yeah, especially over here in that DFW area. You know, he knows mm-hmm. a lot of the lakes. He does a lot of guide fishing. Um, so anybody that's listening to this podcast, if you're ever interested in coming and doing some um, um, kayak fishing in Texas. You can contact Matt, Matthew Scotch on Instagram or um, his social media. Look him up. He does guide fishing kayak in the Brazos River and some other areas. I think Lake Fork, he, he yep. got some nice, um, uh, I don't want to say tourists, but some uh, a couple of guys went um, uh, guide fishing with Matthew Scotch. And, man, Matthew put him on some Hammered big. Uh, and I yeah. know that. Uh, he did a trip a few days after that, and I know they lost a 10-pounder, too. Um, he thinks it was, like, the same 10 or 11-pounder they got the year before. But, yeah, they definitely lost, like, a 10-pounder that day, too. Um, and he actually – I was down there with him in January this year and caught my first Huddleston fish um, down below PK. So that was pretty cool. Um, we probably, like, we, we fished with huds, like, six- and eight-inch huds for probably, like, four hours and, and got a couple, like, six-pounders. So it was, it was really? pretty cool. Yeah, Brazos rivers can really shine uh, mm-hmm. sometimes. Um, I mean, other the only thing is you never know if you got a big, uh, big old striper or a big old bass. Like I've been fooled before that. Like I got my PB and yeah. it's like, oh no, it's a striper. But um, it's fun. It's one of my favorite. My favorite river to fish here in Texas mm-hmm. for sure. That's a cool one. But anyways, Cody, big win, Pro Series, Cato. I wanted to talk a little bit about comparisons between you winning in Caddo um, and what you had uh, on the national championship. You and Gio put on a show. Now, I'm a big fan of kayak fishing, mm-hmm. both as a competitor and as watching, you know, and, and looking at the stats and all that. And I was completely in awe of you guys just trading punches, except ex- especially that last day, that third day you – I kept looking at the leaderboard and it seems like you went up two or three inches and then Gio went up two or three inches and then you went up two or three inches. And finally we get the reveal at the end. Mm-hmm. Winning now, does, does it feel like not vindication, but does it feel extra sweet to you say, okay, I finally got this win at Cato? Um, you, you know, I, don't know. I guess I probably, there was so little comparisons. I probably didn't think of it that way. I was fishing a little bit around G though. He passed me a couple of times the second day. Um, but no, I didn't really think about, it. you know, I don't know. That never really crossed my mind. Um, I, you know, I've won on Caddo before. I think the year before I won the KBF trail on Caddo and I'd finished fifth at the national championship on Caddo before those. I mean, it was probably just more of the fact that, um, I, you know, I, I do really like fishing the lake. Like, I love fishing yeah. trees. Um, and Chad always has done such a good job about putting us on that body of water during the spawn. Because, um, I mean, they were definitely spawning really good. And they were spawning really good, like, three years ago when we were at the national championship down there when Mike won it. Um, and, yeah, I've, just, I've never had bad experiences down there. I mean, legitimately, I think the worst finish I've ever had down there was fifth place. Um, really? That was in the NC too. So it was just like, yeah, really just good mo you know, it's not super far from my house. It's about three and a half, four hours. So it's 
Um, but one of our really good friends, Jamie Broad, lives down there. So, I mean, I've, you know, I've went fishing with him some in the winter down there even. Um, definitely just love the lake. I really do. And if I'm not, if I remember correctly, um, Hobie BOS National Champion or the Tournament of Champions. Yeah. DLC is going to be in Cotto, right? It is, yeah. And I qualified Man. last weekend or I guess two weekends ago now. So, I've got a full bird for the Hobie, so I'll, I'll be down there for sure. So, yeah, I've, I've got yeah. <laughs> You must be licking your lips thinking, yeah. man, oh, man, it could be another big check coming. Yeah, the, the first one, the first ever TOC was in Arkansas, so I was pretty fired up about that one, but um, probably a little more fired up about this one in all honesty. Yeah, I would imagine, man. I, I, I remind me when I do my – pick my anglers for the kayak – um, fantasy league for Cotto. Remember to pick you as my first <laughs> draft pick because I'm pretty sure that you're going to be high up there. That wouldn't be surprised if you win it with uh, the results so. that you've gotten already. Yeah. So, how was the big win? Tell us it's a two day tournament for the yep. Pro Series for KBF. It's not the one day, one day, you know, Saturday, one day, Sunday. So, it's it's the two day. Um, what did you find? Let's ask you this first. What did you find in the pre-fishing going into that? Did you get a chance to pre-fish and how, how did it go? I did. Um, I, pre I pre-fished, I guess probably like three and a half days. I got there around Tuesday mid morning and I actually spent the first two days on Bistano, kind of like trying to relive the magic from the national championship. Yeah. And, uh, I kind of, I mean, it was better than. I mean, to be nine and a half foot higher than it was when we were there, I thought it was fishing fine. Um, but at the same time, the spawn seemed like it was way over there. Like the water temperature seemed five to six degrees warmer on Bistano than it did on Caddo. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I made the decision Thursday to kind of commit the fishing some stuff on Caddo. I've, I've done well on before. And um in all honesty, uh, it was good. I mean, you know, it were like Thursday was really a strong day for me and Friday was too. Um, I kind of got the feeling Friday that things that I'd fished in the national championship like three years ago and one on a cup two years ago, there was probably going to be like 20 or 25 people there. Like that kind of became a reality for me. Um, and it was still kind of wanted to go there. Like in all honesty, I thought the tournament started at seven. It actually started at six thirty. So I got to the boat ramp at six thirty, and everyone was gone. Uh, <laughs> so I was like, "Well, I'm not racing. You know, I'm not going to race way up north. The things I usually go fish. Um, I ended up going south, where I'd caught like there was like eight or nine fish. There was eight or nine trees in a row where, that had all that had beds on every single one of them. Um, you could only see a few of them, but they all were spawning." Um, and I turned the corner through a canal there and could see some, like a camera light go off. Like somebody had already been there for 30 minutes. So like I kept going around the corner, um, fished a couple of those trees where they were spawning and then went around the corner actually. But, um, yeah, I mean, where I ended up spending two days, I only caught one fish in practice. It was like a 21 incher, but, um, kind of just and it wasn't like there wasn't boats and stuff there it was just kind of the only stuff there wasn't kayakers just sitting on um which i mean it's a good thing to do at caddo i mean you know usually when you get an area where they're spawning they're on a lot of those trees you know um but yeah no it worked out i mean i i've said it a couple times now like i really feel like if i would have started at seven that first day i wouldn't have spent my whole tournament where i ended up spending it and there was definitely probably you know a little better quality fish there than i originally thought Nice. So mm -hmm. it kind of worked out in your it favor. It did. Yeah, <laughs> it really kind of did. Yeah. It, it kind of goes that way, right? When it's when it's right there for you for the taking, it just seems like you can't it, do no wrong, it, right? It kind of felt that way, for sure. Mm -hmm. What about day two? What was day two like? Well, day two, like I, you know, started at 630, like, at, at, you know, first cast. And I did catch like one, it was probably close to nine pounds, like five minutes into the tournament. She was like almost 23 inches full of eggs. Um, and I caught her like on a thumper spinner bait, like a Colorado blood spinner bait. Um, and then really didn't get a lot of bites after that for a pretty good while. I think I caught, I'd caught one of the same fish that I'd caught the day before pretty early. And I knew that I did. Um, but other than that, I think maybe I'd caught like one 17 incher in that original kind of starting area. 
Um, I ended up catching two of my best fish probably like 150 yards away from where I spent most of the first day. Um, and I didn't beat those trees up too bad the first day. Like I kind of left them alone and didn't really see a lot of people fish them. So it kind of, I just kind of worked out like the way that the way other anglers fish that area, like, I don't know. It left me a lot of stuff, even being around a lot of people. I felt like. You think like, were you mainly focused on bedding bass? They were, it was so dirty. Like you could only see probably six inches. Um, mm. I actually didn't even have sunglasses the first day and I only saw one fish spawning in practice and it wasn't there. It was actually around the corner. Um, but I mean, I was just looking up, like I already had a pretty good bag the first day and just like saw a 19 inches tail just fanning up on a tree. And it took me probably 20 minutes to catch her. And then I found like another 20 and a quarter, like two trees over doing the same thing. Um, I mean, they were literally so shallow. You really didn't need sunglasses. Um, it was pretty cool. And for so, you, <laughs> so you started 30 minutes late. You didn't have your sunglasses, which is essential yeah. when you're doing <laughs> usually red fishing. So. Yeah, usually. We, so. <laughs> even with all that handicap, you still wound up uh, in first place. <laughs> That's amazing. Still, yeah, it was just, it, like I said, it, you know, it, it really did just work out. Um, I'd been on, you know, Santee Cooper that whole other week with Hobie. So it was... I didn't change a lot. Like there was more fish spawning on Caddo than there was on Santee, but I really caught for two straight weeks. Like I caught every single fish on three lures for the most part, um, which was a Colorado spinner bait, a double willow spinner bait, and just a wacky rig Cinco. Um, I kind of had a pretty good flurry with a buzz bait the second day at Caddo, but I didn't catch any fish on a buzz bait that whole practice period other than both in um it, but it warmed up a lot more that last day like it was probably the warmest day warmest afternoon i had fished there was that sunday afternoon let me ask you this you mentioned on on that uh big bass that you caught you were like mm -hmm. 20 minutes working that bass did i hear that right i spent 20 minutes fishing for like an 18 and a half incher yeah it was it was it, it, i got two on the beds and one was probably i think one was 20 and a quarter and one was like 18 and a half but I didn't see any the second day. And I even had, I had my sunglasses the second day. Didn't see one fish on a bed. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. What, why did like walk me through the patience process of just working a fish for like 20 minutes? How did you commit to just saying 20 minutes? What, what were you starting off with? And then what, how did you end up catching it? So I started off with a Cinco because, I mean, that was what was in my hand. But, like, I mm -hmm. saw her well before she saw me, and she didn't pay any interest into that Cinco. Like, even when I thought she might have been a bowfin up there, like, I twitched it right by her nothing. Um, then I think I switched to a white lizard for probably, like, five or six minutes and really didn't get a lot of attention on a white lizard. Um, but it was like, as soon as I put a war mouth in there, that was kind of the deal. Like a yellow belly war mouth was, was the answer. Um, and I caught the second one on a, on a thread fin, uh, war mouth. And war mouth is for those that don't know, they might be listening that don't, don't know what to um, do. It's made, I think, I'm pretty sure it's made by big bites. It's, I mean, it's probably one of the more like old school sight fishing baits. I'm pretty sure that's still what caught the biggest stringer ever with Dean Rojas down at, you know, Lake Toho years ago. When he caught like that 46 pounds or whatever. And that's so, a soft plastic bait? Yeah, it's a little, it's just like a little, uh, it looks like a brim. Two little tails, it looks like a flat brim. Nice. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, so, wow, 20 minutes. I'm still starting to wrap my head around it because I was, like I mentioned, I was just pre fishing and I remember that was what I was looking, eyeballing some bets. Now, unfortunately, I could. The fish saw me. I was right on top of the bed when I saw it. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, crap, there's a bed right here. It's just left. Um, so I backed away from it. And I followed. I remember from our previous podcast, which was you just anchored in, mm -hmm. just waited it out because eventually mm -hmm. it's going to come back. That's what I did. I just waited it out. And then I was trying to cast. And then we're just talking on the uh, pre-recording. It, it's, it's a windy day. And we're in, like, clips and... Um, ledges so the wind kind of spins you around mm -hmm. and I kept casting and the wind kept you know it's a weightless Senko 
And it's crazy because I'm like throwing it. It comes to a point where the wind is so bad that it's creating all these ripples. Now I can't see. I she said yeah. two foot of water, and I have ten feet of visibility. But now the ripples on the water with because of the wind, I can't see it. So I'm just throwing it and just watching my line, just waiting for my line to move until then. I see the line moving against the wind, and I'm thinking, okay, it's gotta be that she got it. And right there, I set the hook, and I got it. That's awesome. And it does take a lot of, you know, man, it does. the yeah. the feeling of like, okay, finally I got her after. I mean, I stay with it like probably less than ten minutes. I don't know if yeah. I could be that's that patient. Quick, Twenty though. minutes. Yeah, that's pretty quick. Now let me ask you this, because I, I now I need your advice though. Mm -hmm. I saw like five different beds, and all of them had bass. Mm -hmm. um, one of them and most of them had the big female mm -hmm. which two of them were like huge meal i'm like good lord if i can catch that female <laughs> <laughs> by tournament day i'll be so happy and then they had the male and one of them the male caught the the bass before mm -hmm. the female did is there anything in particular other than keeping it which i have to look at the rules i'm assuming it's like most tournaments where you cannot keep the male you have to release it before you cast again yeah is there anything in particular that you do to try to get the big female to bite the lure? Um, I mean, they're all different. I mean, I thought Drew Cook did a really fantastic job at Santee a couple weeks ago. Because, um, I mean, yeah, he had, he caught a couple females where he probably wouldn't have caught them if the male would have been in there. And then that fourth day, he caught one of his best. He released like a three pounder just because the female wasn't reacting like he thought it should. Um, so he actually released his fifth fish to put you know to put the male back on the bed, um, and that settled the female back down. You know, and then she kind of locked on. So that's, you know, in our situation, it's like yeah, all you can really do is drag the male off. You know, you know, paddle away fifty or sixty yards, and then release it. Um, but no, with, with them, you know, yeah, you can kind of play both sides of it. Like if she's a little jumpy, once you have taken the male out of there, I mean, a lot of times, yeah, once you take the male on, they do lock on pretty hard, but sometimes they'll get, you know, way more weary with the female being gone. Um, I don't find it that way most of the time, but it definitely can be that way. Um, but yeah, no, it's kind of difficult in our, like, I think now I always, if I catch the male, I always release it pretty, you know, pretty quickly near the bed. Cause I feel like I can catch it again. If I think I need to drag it off, like that's probably the main reason. Um, but yeah, no, you're almost, it almost seems like a safer bet to not drag the male off first, but to kind of do that as a ladder option. Yeah, I know. I, I'm thinking along the same lines that you're thinking in that aspect. It's funny because mm -hmm. um, I was um, fishing Lake Fork last year and mm -hmm. the house I stayed with, uh, Blake Knight was there. And then Blake Knight, we were talking about, well, I found some bedding bass on, on Lake Fork and I hadn't had the experience that I have now. And I was asking Blake Knight about it and he was telling me. And I thought at that moment he was BSing me because I didn't even think um, that was really possible but i've seen it now and one of the things he was telling me is the female when you throw into that bed right the female a lot of times it's gonna go to the male and harass the male to pick up whatever a lot of times. it's on the bed mm -hmm. and i was like nah that can't be like really yeah and i that actually happened to me last uh last mm -hmm. year i mean i caught that male like three or four times and i could see it right there and the female would nose it and just kind of like turn around, go get the mail. And then you see the mail come right in front of her, grab yep. it. And then I hook the mail and then the female follows the mail all the way up to the boat. Yep. Um, so it's it's crazy to think that that, that holds true. All, pretty, I don't know if all the time, but I mean, Blake, Blake Knight, which uh, I completely trust now <laughs> with that yep. information. I mean, we're talking about a two year span difference. Mm -hmm. What he's telling me, I'm sure it's like, have you experienced something like that? Absolutely. Have you notice that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, now, I mean, I like probably one of the biggest bed and fish I've ever fished for. It was on a, it was on a pond I lived near, near on in Florida and she was probably like 12 or 13 pounds. And like, I know for a fact, 
she wasn't there the day before. And then she didn't show up until probably nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. And then I fished for her until the sun went down at probably five. And like, she was gone after that. Like you see some crazy stuff. And like, I went the two, three days in a row after that, never saw her again. Like, and it, that I mean, just, I feel like you have those moments where it kind of like either affirms things you've heard or like, you know, want to believe, but like yeah. that one for me kind of made me believe that it's like when you have those full moon nights, like they'll lay a lot of those eggs at night. Um, and I mean, it, it just kind of makes you feel like, yeah, there's some fish that stay up there for, you know, days on end, but a lot of those really big ones, they get up there and they're gone in 12 hours. I mean, more times than not, a lot of those big ones are that way. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, to think about it. What is it about, and I've heard this before, and somebody told me that usually the first full moon after spring is some of the best bite. Mm -hmm. um, do you agree with that? Do you think that's is that's right? And why do you think that is? In your there, yeah, there's some truth to that. I mean, I don't, you know, a lot of people say they don't move up hard on a new moon, and I don't, I've never bought that. They do. It's just a lot later in the day. It feels like a lot of times your new moon, which is what we had last weekend, was like a new moon on Friday. Was yeah, the, most of those fish weren't on beds in the morning. Like they would get on them at like noon until four, and then they would be gone. You know, um, but no. Oh, Cody, you might have gone. Oh, I lost you for a second. You back? Can you hear me? Can you... Yeah, I can hear you. Whoops. Last Cody, 22nd, 32nd. Got you back again. Back? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> no, no worries. That's not a big deal. That's um, Ooh, we can edit that out, anyways. Um, but um, yeah, I can't remember what we're talking about. But uh, I get text <laughs> message and it, like it, any it, anytime I get a text message, like all my volume goes blank for some reason. I don't know. No worries. But yeah, you were talking about the the so the blue the moon on the uh, on the first um first new moon or first full moon on on uh, spring. It's interesting because I've. I don't know how much I believe the whole lunar calendar thing. Like I have an app, yeah. I have like two or three apps that go with the lunar ca um, calendar or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and tells you the best fishing times. Now I went one day fishing for sand bass or hybrids actually mm -hmm. in Lake Louisville. And I checked the, the, um, the lunar app or whatever app it was. And it was telling me bite's going to be poor. And at one o'clock, it's going to be great up until three o'clock and then it's going to die down. That's according to the app. I'm like, I don't know yeah. how much I believe it, but I went there early in the morning. Couldn't get a bite. I promise you, I don't know what happened. The first bite I got, I looked at my phone and I'm like, sure enough, it's one o'clock. Yep. Like, just like it said. And I caught, I didn't catch a limit. I mean, a, a limit for sand bass is 25. I didn't catch yeah. a limit, but I caught like 10 of them. Mm -hmm. throughout that whole two hour period and then after three o'clock the bite completely changed and i was like mm -hmm. okay now i'm a believer on it now when i go to fish i don't i don't go to fish looking at the lunar calendar because at this point i'm like i'm gonna fish because this is the only time i gotta go to fish you know i'm yeah. not gonna <laughs> move my whole life through a lunar calendar you know yeah. i'm not mayan or <laughs> any or an aztec <laughs> or whatever um previous civilization did that but do you did you abide by that? Do you think the loon the whole lunar calendar thing and and uh, I keep calling it lunar calendar, but it's, yeah, that's uh, close. Yeah, lunar whatever it is, lunar phase, lunar phase whatever. Do you really when you look at it? Do you really think that that holds true? Absolutely. Yep. No, I thoroughly do. Um, all and I always have to. I mean, from when I was a kid, I feel like I've, I've I don't know how many times I've noticed it now, but it's a ton. Um, and, and like, even in new, like those new moon scenarios, like, like that fish that I caught on Saturday, I'd caught her at probably one, you know, and that, the, that moon would have been, that moon would have been overhead around one. Like, I don't think she was on the bed that long. Um, 
And I mean, yeah, I mean, I've seen that happen a lot. I will say this though. Um, I feel like when you're in tropical climates like uh, Carolinas or Florida or even probably like East Georgia type of stuff, places where they can spawn for a long time with, Mm -hmm. with correct water temperatures. I don't think it makes as much of a difference when you're in places like, you know, the Ozarks where, you know, where I am, like we don't have a good window to spawn for very long, like you do in South Carolina. And I feel like when you're in those places where they can spawn forever, those moon phases are even more crucial because like they can wait that extra week where it's like they wait an extra week in Arkansas. Like we may already be in, you know, 85, 90 degrees and, you know, warming up 10 or 12 degrees a day. Um, so it's like, I feel like it's more weather dependent in the central parts of the States. And I feel like as you get on the coast, I feel like it's more moon phase dependent. That's really interesting. Never even yeah. thought about that, but yeah, it makes mm-hmm. a whole lot of sense the way you explained it. What was your biggest bass for this tournament over here in Cauda for the pro series? Uh, it, that 22 and three quarter it was like six minutes into the second day. Did you, did you get a chance to wait it or just measured it? I didn't, but I, it was definitely like, mid eights like i think it was definitely probably eight and a half or eight three or so interesting mm-hmm. that is a huge bass now yeah, it was, for, late it was a good Cotto, for late Cotto standards i know last year uh on that national championship i mean what was your biggest bass i and i know you weren't fishing lake Cotto, but it was kind of yeah like that so area. I don't know if I had a 23. It was a lot of 22s, like a lot of 21 somethings and a lot of 22 and a halves. But I, I know I caught a couple 23s in practice, but I don't think I ever had a 23 during the tournament. That's there's huge bass over there in Cotto. There's some sure. big ones. Did you have to deal with a lot of gators this time around? I didn't see one the whole time. Yeah. Really? Good didn't for you. see salt snakes <laughs> climbing trees, but no gators. <laughs> Yeah, that's the only thing about Cato that it's just like, well, you know, they're going to run into big reptiles in some shape or form. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) What about South Carolina? I know um, um, Ryan Lambert ran into a growling uh, (laughs) gator that made him think twice, made him take a business decision. What about South Carolina? Do you have there to was go? A, there was a decent amount of them there. Um, they weren't like way up in the woods where I was, but when I fished some like more main lake stuff, they were they were in there pretty thick. Did you ever have to leave a fishing a good fishing spot because you're like you know there's a big Jurassic style reptile no, there and I, I can't don't say I've had that happen. No, no, I, that hadn't happened to me yet. I think I had that happen to me twice. One is in like have four. You? <laughs> And once in, what was the other one? Oh, um, Toledo Bend uh, for yeah. the Hobie BOS. Lake Fork, it was just the massiveness of it. It was just like, it was like, I've now I've talked to a few locals who are like, yeah, they even have a name for it. I don't remember what it is, but they, they say it's about a 15-foot gator. And I believe them. It's like huge yeah. gator. I'm like, well, it's one of those things where it's like, if that thing decides it wants to eat me, there's nothing I can do. And I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. So I just like, <laughs> I was like, I punked out. I'm like, I'm not dealing with this. I don't yeah. care what he's doing. But the other one in uh, um, Toledo Bend, mm-hmm. it wasn't as big. It was just, it was a really, really um, narrow channel. And his mm-hmm. head was lying on one side. The tail on the other. I'm like, the only way to get to where I want to go is actually going over this guy, and I'm not doing it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what his reaction is going to be when he sees a kayak going over him. So I'm just going to let it be. But yeah, that's it's always that's the fun thing about kayak. You can't experience oh, that yeah. on a boat. That's true. That that sense of vulnerability, <laughs> you don't get it on a boat. Yeah, for sure. Very true. awesome. Uh, let me ask you a little bit about the Pro Series. Mm-hmm. Now, as a fan and as a competitor, I love the fact that um, KBF is having a Pro Series, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if it's sustainable or not. I don't know much about the business side of it to say, well, they're doing it wrong or they're doing it right. Mm-hmm. From my uh, perspective, I'm not a big fan of how it's done, and I wonder if it's going to be sustainable. Um what is your thoughts on the pro series of KBF and in your mind, the way that you, your experience, experience fishing it, 
Mm -hmm. Do you see it sustainable or do you expect to be major changes for this to actually um, get traction? Um, I mean, I think the only major, major change you'll see is like, I, I do think there'll be separate events. Um, yeah. I feel like there's already been some weird scenarios this year with like, you know, people that were leading the pro series versus people that weren't in it, you know, that they were totally starting a new second day, you know, and it was like, I don't know. It has created some weird scenarios, not necessarily for me, but um, well, I mean, with a few people I know for sure is just like, I, you know, it's kind of a weird thing. You, you know, do you back off an area even though you caught them there, but you're not in the two day tournament where someone else could win the two day tournament, you know, because there is a lot more money on the line for that. Yeah. Two -day. Um, but no, I think the biggest change you'll see and probably need to see is going to be the fact that they will be separate, you know, like, we may be on Caddo a week or two before the trail series is there, or vice versa. Um, but now, I mean, it seems like participation has been, you know, relatively high, I would say, especially with the amount of, you know, entry fee money that it is. Um, and the payouts are really good. Um, I mean, I think everyone that's won a pro series this year, you know, it's been close to $10,000 weekend for them. So, I mean, I think that's got to turn some ears and, the other thing that I what didn't really know was the Pro Series championships are like guaranteed fifty thousand dollars for first, and I don't think you know that's been talked about a whole lot either. Um, so I mean, there's definitely some strong incentive for fishing it, you know, even this year. But I would like to see it on a separate, you know, separate day, which I think will happen. Yeah, and and I agree. I think that's probably the main, yeah, sticking point for me. Um, <laughs> For different reasons, and we don't have to go all over it. I think it's 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 a weird point by now. And but I I understand um mm -hmm. the decision, right? That they're trying to build something but at the same time, trying to consolidate some expenses because obviously it's going to be more expensive if you hold it separate tournaments from the uh the trail series to the pro series. Yeah, by doing it both at the same lake, you kind of cut expenses for them, and I get it. And if this is just kind of like a um, something that we have to get used to for the first year until it builds to something that can be sustainable. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. I mean, we yeah. may not like it right now, but if that's a, like a necessary step, I think it is. Stone, yeah. To get to the next level, then it's going to be worth so. it. I mean, if five years from now their game plan really works out, then I think, you know, it worked yep. out. No, At I agree. the moment, like, like you mentioned, it, it, it is something of a, uh, uh, of kind of the weird scenarios where you like mm -hmm. who actually won the weekend or stuff like that. Yeah, for um, sure. Looking at the, the other major trails like the Hobie BOS, Bass Masters, Kayak Series, do you ever do you think any of them at some point will have a pro series? Um, I think it's easy to believe that Bass would because I feel like they've got probably the I don't know, in a lot of ways, they probably have the easiest route to it, like as far as doing mm -hmm. a baby elite series or something along those lines. Um, not saying like that is, you know, happening or going to, but I mean, I think that seems like a pretty easy guess from this point. Um, but now I don't see Hobie. I mean, I feel like Hobie will always kind of be that open, you know, that true open sense of, um, you know, competition, which is good. I mean, I feel like, you know, you kind of have to have that, that open type of invitational almost. Um, and like, I mean, obviously KBF's kind of already done it, but as far as seeing like a, a set field or something like that for events, I think that's something you will see in the near future. Um, and then to me, that's kind of what actually dictates it being a, like a pro series or something is probably having a set field for the season. And, you know, knowing these 50 anglers are going to these six tournaments. Um, I yeah. feel like that'd be pretty entertaining for people to see. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think when it's really going to solidify, it's going to be when the technology matches our ambition. And by that, yeah. I mean, right now, it costs money. To run a tournament. Like we are bass, mm -hmm. in, the, in the basketball world, you can put a cameraman, you know, um, record and then have that signal boosted from the trucks. And, I, and I'm not an expert on how all mm -hmm. that works. Right now, I think the next step, if at some point action cameras like GoPros can actually, and I know some of them have the capability of doing going live streaming, yeah. But the problem is, most of those lakes, you know, you know, like I don't know, Cattle, but like Whitney Lake, I had no signal at all. Oh, yeah, I know Lake Fork, you have barely any signal. 
Um, a lot of those great lakes have almost no signal at all, just mm -hmm. because they're outside uh, outside the city limits. So they tend mm -hmm. to be better than those recreational um, lakes, which tend to have more signal because they're in the middle of the city, right? Mm -hmm. um, once I think that comes into play and it's more cost effective to do a live streaming, mm -hmm. I think that's when you'll see a, a pro series really evolve. Yeah. Can it evolve before that? I don't have. I don't know. It, maybe it could. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Bassmaster series. I think the bat. Like I agree with you. The Bassmaster series. I mean, Bassmaster has the resources and yeah. come like the open highway to do it. My opinion on it is Bassmaster is more into like they want their money up front, right? They yeah. want their profit up front. Yeah. So for them, and it's obviously not going to happen this year, especially when you consider it, Harris. Um, the next event, which is at Oklahoma, I wouldn't say Harrison Chains, but I think I'm confusing that with Florida. It's not Harrison Chains. It's, it's Grand Lake, I think. Grand Lake. Yeah, Harrison yeah. Chains was in Florida. Grand Lake is not going to hit 50 anglers. Um, yeah, probably not. Probably not. So unless Bassmaster decides, hey, you know what, we're going to pony up and we're going to put the money and hope that Dick's, this works out. Like we'll put the money yeah. up front and work towards the building it for the future. If they ever mm -hmm. decide to do that, I think they can do it. Hobie BOS has an interesting dilemma because now you see them getting oversold in like mm -hmm. a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. Like the la Well, not the last one. The last one is in the Northeast, which we don't mm -hmm. expect that one to get oversold just because in the Northeast, mm -hmm. it's not that popular over there. But anything that's not in the Northeast or the West Coast, it's pretty much getting oversold in nine minutes. The, yeah. the, the last one that got sold out. Mm -hmm. I can see Hobie BOS... Just kind of like saying, well, why don't we do a qualifying pro series? Just because mm -hmm. I know a lot of like, for example, one of the names that I saw on the wait list, and hopefully he can get on, is Brian Howell. And I saw yeah. other boats today. That's the one that stands out. Yeah. That was like, oh, man, now I can't, you know, fish a tournament that mm -hmm. maybe would have qualified me for the TOC. Hopefully it won't cost him the TOC. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's that worry that, that those quote-unquote – PK, PKA or National Trail um, anglers like yourself mm -hmm. are going to have to be like, I'm, you know, I need to qualify for the, I need to, to participate in the Hobie BOS. It's kind of like your life would, even yeah. though if it's not you personally in your case, but I know for mm -hmm. a few of them they are. But now if it's getting sold out in nine minutes, you don't have signal. You have to like literally work your life around the schedule when it comes out. Whereas doing a qualifying tournament would kind of like be better. Because mm -hmm. right now, I think there's about, you tell me, Cody, something between 70 and 90 anglers to national trails consistently. Would you say Probably, that's about right? I would say, yeah, definitely in the right ballpark for sure. So, I mean, that's enough to sustain like a 50 mm -hmm. um, angler qualifying event. I yeah. wouldn't be surprised if that's one of the routes AJ goes with it. I noticed... And I was yeah. thinking about this because I noticed that it used to be like if you pay for a tournament and then you couldn't go, you can say, hey, you know what? We'll put it for my next tournament. Mm -hmm. And as soon and as I and as soon as I saw the other tournament sold out in nine minutes, I'm like, I bet you somebody is going to buy a ticket for the next tournament. Say again, show up and then move it to Darnell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Probably. And now AJ Got ahead of that. Says no, no, no. Yep. If you don't qualify, we'll give you the money if you cancel within time. But we're not gonna roll it over. Cause I thought the same thing. I'm like, man, somebody is. I bet you somebody's gonna say, well, I want to qualify for this one. I don't want to get, or I want to buy the ticket for this one. But I don't know if I'm just to ensure my spot. I'll buy it for this one and then <laughs> yeah. roll it over. So, and that wouldn't be fair. But go ahead. No, I mean, I, I think he, you know, he definitely kind of nipped it in the bud the right way. I feel like with the new policy they have. Yep, I think he got on top of it. Like I, he did. we figured we all would. Um, yep. a lot of challenges for AJ. He kind of created this monster of the mm -hmm. Hobie BOS where everyone takes a part of, and now he has a lot more work. I think that he was expecting this year, which yeah. is good. Oh, he yeah. said it himself in a post. It's a good problem to have. Yep. I'm yep. crossing my fingers that this will merge into something where. It kind of forces the hand of Hobie and saying, well, might as well do mm -hmm. a, a pro series. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see where it goes. Overall, 
Uh, Cody, your thoughts on your season so far? Um, I mean, it, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, it's obviously been pretty good. Um, I kind of had a tough time down in Florida at Kissimmee. I think I only finished maybe seventh or so at the 10 and didn't do great in the 10 invitational, but, um, you know, then finished like fourth out of 200 at Toledo and then had like another kind of poor tournament at Lake Murray. Um, but, you know, then kind of like rebounded and had like a third place, you know, tournament at Santee after that. So it's kind of been an up and, you know, other than the last two weeks, yeah, it's kind of been, you know, a good tournament here, a bad tournament there, but, um, this is kind of my time of the year. You know, I like fishing the, these spawn tournaments and even pre-spawn tournaments. And we've got a couple more of them. But, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not letting up the gas. I feel like I need to get after – I feel like I need to get after Eufaula and Gunnersville while while there's still a lot of fish shallow, but, you know, before the live scopers start beating us all. <laughs> Do you feel like in order for you to, like, um, guaranteed a, a chance at the end to be an angler of the year with the KBF mm -hmm. last master or Hobie BOS. Do you feel like you need to perform now where it's like the, your favorite time of fishing or the, where you exceed the best? A little more so. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the last three years, my best Hobies have been my first three Hobies. Like they've been all top, you know, sevens or 11s or something in that range. And then it's kind of, it's not like it's been horrible from there, but it's just like I've never done any better than that in those later tournaments. Um, I mean, I'll have some good fall tournaments every once in a while, but there definitely seems like there's that period in the summer where I've struggled the last few years. Um, man, I mean, I kind of want to guard against that a little bit this year. I really do. What, what have been some of your career accolades? I know you won Rookie of the Year for KBF in the first year. Is that correct? I've won – no, because I think I fished one tournament – I won Angler of the Year the second year I fished with them. Okay. But I think I fished one tournament the year before that, which I don't think was enough for, like, the Rookie of the Year. But I won Angler of the Year twice. Hmm. I always thought you got – I don't know why I'm, I got in my head that you have won Rookie of the Year for the KBF on your mm -hmm. first year of the KBF. I don't know why. Maybe I'm fishing with somebody else. But um, other than that, Angler of the Year, which tournaments, which tournaments do you feel are – whether because of their schedule or because they allow mortars or they don't allow mortars, which tournament do you think um, kind of like gives you more confidence that you can win a, like an angler of the year race? Um, well, I mean, in all honesty, we've already passed <laughs> probably two of the ones I would have said between Lake Murray in South Carolina for KBF and, you know, going down to Cato like we just did. Um, and I would have put Santee up there with Hobie as well. Um, Susquehanna's one. I feel like I really need to do well at Susquehanna. I feel like I could maybe have a tough time at Eufaula coming up here in a few weeks for Hobie. Um, but for, I mean, the, where I'm kind of sitting with KBF, like I'm really just looking for one more good finish, like whether that be at Gunnersville or Percy Priest. Um, so I'll probably fish a little more aggressively in some of those tournaments, you know, knowing that I don't really need two days. I really just need one good event. Awesome. What has been, in your mind, what has been your biggest win or the one that you're most proud of that you say that's this is the, like the top, do your favorite yeah. trophy? Um, I, you know, probably uh, it's hard to not say the Challenge Championship last year, you know, on Bissonneau and Caddo. Um, but, you know, that one was kind of like, not to say it was easy, but I knew that it was going to be good. You know, I feel like some of the best tournaments you fish are probably the ones where you don't necessarily have a great practice and or things don't go how you think they're going to go in the tournament and you totally adjust and it still works out. And, I mean, that's kind of what happened to me last week. Like, I, you know, it's – I don't – I mean, it's hard to say it's probably the best event I've ever fished, but in a lot of ways, like – I stayed really calm when some things probably didn't, you know, you could have easily went the other way and, you know, it, it started really looking up for me after that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it would be, it would be, it would be one win down in Shreveport though. It would be either the challenge series or last weekend. Yeah. I forgot on the KBF. I keep thinking the national championship, but I forgot you did win the challenge series yep. on, on, on that weekend. Congratulations mm -hmm. uh, on, on that regard as well. Um, when the year starts, not maybe not this necessarily this year, but whatever year, when the year starts, which at which um, championship, whether it's a national championship or the KBF, the TOC or the Bassmaster Cadillac Series Championship, 
which one do you have marked in your calendar as the one that you want to win? Uh, I mean, last year it would have definitely been Cato, you know, for KBF. And I mean, this year it's, I don't know, it's hard to say it's not Cato, you know, down at the TOC. Um, I've had really good tournaments on Kentucky Lake and I am kind of looking forward to going back there for the, for the KBF national championship, but it's going to be a tough one. <laughs> I don't think the fishing is going to be all that good. It'll be a grinder, which will probably be good for me. But, um, yeah, I mean, at the start of the year, I was probably most wanting to, I mean, it's hard to say like not the national championship because you always want to make the 10, like that's, you know, mm -hmm. it's such a good time, you know, another excuse to go down to Florida early in the year. So it's hard to not say that, but um, as far as the fishing goes, I definitely wanted to make it down to Caddo this year. That's awesome. Okay, so before I let you go, I got to see, I uh, got a couple of questions that I want to ask, like rapid fire questions. You ready? All right. All right. Let's go. So not counting this year, not counting whatever lakes they choose in general, mm -hmm. the Mass Master Kayak Series, their national championship, you win, you get a lot more media publicity. Mm -hmm. Their TOC, it's more like the, I would say, the quote-unquote, the elites, right, where, where most of the uh, the quote-unquote hammers, you know, always trying to win that tournament. It's only mm -hmm. 50 of them, but it's 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 really the top 50 in the country. And then you got the national championship, which almost everybody can qualify if they want to, mm -hmm. but you win a boatload of money on that one. Yeah. Out of the one, two, three, if you can, if I were to tell you, you're going to be one, you're going to win one of those two threes, in your career, and that's the only national or TLC championship that you're going to be. Which one would you want it to be? I would say the national championship for sure. Uh, and not just because it's more money, because there's typically 400 to 600 people there. And like, you got to catch them for three days. I mean, I know you got to catch them at the TOC for three days now, but um, I mean, both are unbelievable wins, but I feel like a national championship would, you know, would be top on that list. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Do you love to win or do you hate to lose which one do you <laughs> probably, hate to choose? probably a little bit of both probably more of the hate to lose though hate to um, lose. yeah that's probably the truth honest honest reaction mm -hmm. what was your reaction when you came up second place at the national championship your honest reaction what was it um and I've said this, but man, I, you couldn't, it couldn't have been a better person that won that. Thing. Oh yeah. That's I mean, yeah, that's the bottom line. I don't think I could have felt, you know, I mean, maybe if it had been someone else, but not, not Guillermo, I mean, he's a really good friend and even probably a better angler than most people even realize. And he's, I mean, he's unreal in all, so many regards. So it was hard to be very upset about that at all. In all honesty. Is there any side of your competitive nature that, you go to a tournament, you see Gio, and there's a little piece of you that says, I want to beat him just because he beat me at the national championship. Any at all. Not to say there's malice of it, because of course, there's yeah. no, I mean, you're both great guys, you're friends and all that. But is there any competitive nature that says, I want to get him back for this? Anything Not at really. all? Yeah, so Toledo would have been the next tournament that I fished with him after that, I think. And or No, that's not true, because he, he came down to Florida and won like his next tournament yeah. after that. Um, no, Toledo, I think he was like one spot above me after day one. So I was like, I, I tried to make it a point to beat him that second day, but no, no, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, it would have been all in all good and fun. So that's good. Um, yep. <laughs> and again, Gio is, is a great, a great human being. Absolutely. And, uh, fortunate to have both you, Gio and a bunch of other people that are mm -hmm. just, you know, great people to have associated in the kayak fishing sport because mm -hmm. you all lift the sport both on the water and outside the water uh with your camaraderie what would be what is your favorite bait probably your a buzz bait favorite. yeah buzz probably bait? yeah probably an accent you know black buzz bait what bait do you occasionally use but you absolutely hate to use and which you've never had to use it but you do anything texas rigged unless i'm sight really <laughs> yeah i hate texas rigged yeah really why is that um i just always feel like the hookup ratio is pretty poor for the most part and i just haven't caught a lot of big fish on a texas rig in all honesty i mean outside of like swimming a worm no like i, don't, I really don't like even when i'm fishing ledges usually i throw like swing heads or you know like a bigger mob jig or something or a long you know a big shaky head but no i don't like texas rig stuff i really don't 
Yeah. That's crazy. But I mean, <laughs> hey, your preference. Uh, obviously, it's worked out for you in your career. So, <laughs> so no <far>. problem with <laughs> that. If that, I mean, if that's the way God, you get cash checks, is keep doing what you're doing, man. Yep. Um, favorite rod and reel setup? Probably it's so. Uh, I've, I switched to Dobbins this year, um, and I would say I've been liking – I like the 610-4. I think Gary designed it for skipping docks and stuff, but I've really liked skipping a buzz bait with it. Um, it's pretty – it's legit. Like, it's, it's only a 610, a four-power rod, so it's pretty – and it's a short handle. You can really work it around pretty good. Um, that's probably my favorite rod right now. It's kind of – I don't know. I say that it's kind of been a year of the three powers that I feel like I've, I've thrown a seven Oh three on my spinner baits for the most part of this year. Um, so yeah, I would say one of the two, a seven Oh three or the six ten four from Dobbins. When you say three, that uh, power, like, that's what a me medium. Yeah. It's like a medium. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Mm -hmm. Cool, man. That's awesome. Um, if you had a chance to fish with somebody uh, that whether it's historical person, person that's currently with us currently or not with us, whether it's family member, somebody famous, you had a chance to go fishing, a fishing trip with one person. Who do you want to go with? Um, it would probably be uh, Rick Klun or Larry Nixon. Oh, yeah. As a lot older I get, probably would lean almost towards Larry Nixon. Not that Rick Klun's not still crushing it, but Larry Nixon just lives up the road. So he's pretty close. And, you know, growing up, I'd see him around more, but I hadn't seen him much recently. Um, Any reason in particular why you would uh, pick? Uh... Man, just because no matter what's ever happened to him, he always catches them. You know, he had a surgery where he couldn't use bait casters for three years. So he'd be in like the top 10, just throwing a spinning reel, like for AOY. And then, he had to switch sides that he had his spinning reel and then, you know, was still top 10 in AOY. It was just like, it seemed like anything's ever happened to him. He always kind of came out on top. I remember you had a tournament in the um, KBF. I want to say it's about three years ago mm -hmm. that you, you were just, you had a brand new, if I'm like, and I've correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you had a brand new um, fish finder and it wasn't <laughs> working out for you. You got skunked the first day. The next yep. day you got everything out, went completely blind as far as fish finder. Yep. And you crushed it and won the second day. Yep. That's right? Yeah, I think that was in that was in Indiana, Lake Monroe. Yeah. Yep. That is that was crazy. The, just the thing <laughs> it was like, cool. man, I don't know if I could ever do something like that in the sense of just fishing by instinct. Um, yeah, and just have that confidence to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing this out. I'm not throwing it out, but I'm just removing this. I'm just gonna go with my instinct. That's that's yep. that's next level right there. And d definitely speaks to why you're one of the greats in this sport, man. Just having that that confidence in your instinct and being able to crush it, even though you have, you know, you're going like uh, primal with it, it. That's pretty awesome, man. <laughs> I appreciate it. Cody, congratulations on the season that you had so far on um, your latest win. We wish you the best moving forward, man. We look forward to seeing you on the water and seeing what's next. Before I let you go, I always like to give a chance uh, to my special guest to kind of give shout outs, mm -hmm. plugs. Um, so if you want to take a few minutes to thank anybody you want to thank, companies, families, whoever you want to give a thanks to, go ahead. No, absolutely. Um, I mean, Fish USA, they've, I think they've been helping me for almost four years now. Um, and I mean, they've, I mean, you can order a Hobie kayak from them, you know, Cinco's it's, you know, pretty much a, like a tackle warehouse and just as quick, um, Dakota lithium. I mean, they, I've been with them for two years now and I, it's hard to imagine I had batteries before lithiums at this point, you know, I've been running so many 24 volts, uh, batteries and like, you know, two fifty amp hours ran together for my Newport NK 180 that, um, I just couldn't imagine doing some of the things I'm doing now with like a lead acid battery and they've helped tremendously. And, um, I mean, just like Newport vessels, I mean, I know they kind of changed the game a little bit, you know, for people this year, as far as just a, you know, a cheaper entry level motor to get, to get people going. But, um, I mean, that's the only motor I've had, like I've had four different motors and I've made it on this one for over a year. So it kind of, it's quite the testimony to how durable those motors really are. Um, I've already said Dobbins rods, but it's been a really good switch for me this year. Um, and 
catch products. Um, it's kind of the board, you know, we all use now. Um, and they've got really good YouTube content. If you haven't seen some of their videos that Dusty does over there, they've, they've got some really good stuff, but I mean, all those companies, man, it's, it's hard to fish, you know, 16, 18, you know, events a year and not have some good support behind you. So I appreciate all of them. And thanks awesome. for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh man. My honor to have you on, man. You're always welcome here anytime. Thank you. Um, Cody, um, I was going to say, I forgot. Oh, God, I forgot what I was going to say. Completely forgot. It's going to come to me. But anyways, for those out there listening, thank you for tuning in to Bass Kayak and Beers podcast. Um, remember, if you're going to be on the water, please wear your PFDs. If you're going to have a couple of beers, make sure you do it responsibly and take care of yourself. Uh, go check out the sponsor. Go to DouglasOutdoors.com. Check out your favorite uh, LRS, X-Matrix, or Five Fishing Broad. Thank you to Cody for joining us. Have a great day, everyone. Have enjoy your time on the water. Thank you.